and uh, it has an internship for here, like in Seattle, in AI Institute, um, uh, because they have a collaboration with uh, Nathan and Stephen. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, I think uh, Ludger said that he has 80 slides. So I don't uh, want to add uh, anything about his topic. I will stop him on the first slide anyways. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to talk. Um, just like up. Uh, so this is not only work of me, like of many people, like uh, a lot of the stuff requires a lot of software engineering. So writing with one person is pretty much impossible. I need a lot of knowledge around uh, compilation tools, chains of also language front ends. So um, to sort of tie this a bit into what you guys seem to be doing according to GitHub at least, uh, for example, like I just took a brief glance at uh, CoinStack and I will come back to that later a bit. So we use something they called Number, which is essentially uh, a tool to take Python and compile it into an executable, which is supposed to run much more efficiently. And that's also kind of where we live. Like we basically live on the LVM level. And so I will first give a very brief recap. What is automated differentiation? What are the main modes of automated differentiation that people actually use and what they what are they useful for? Like there exist two main modes and both of them have the ups and downsides depending on what you want to do. Then I'll basically go into what we actually do is like compiler-based automated differentiation. Uh, and then we did some extensions, uh, basically running general kernels on GPUs and also being able to do like MPI, OpenMP, all kinds of parallelism that you can imagine. And the most recent thing that we are currently finishing up is basically that we have a differential version of number. So if we go back to the CoinStack example, we essentially want to just want to make it very, very easy for someone who just wants to write uh, normal Python code that they just by basically switching decorator. You can make your code differentiable and get fault or reverse mode gradients and whatever your scientific use case governs, uh, make it useful for you. Like basically make it as easy as possible for you to use without you having to change anything in your main kernel. Um, yeah, that's sort of like the way that we usually uh, try to do stuff. So just brief glance, uh, going back to um, probably high school maths for most of you. Um, so this is sort of like the, the way we analysis you derive a uh, derivative basically where you have this like infinitesimal h and then you set it to zero to actually get the true derivative. And a lot of approaches that people use like symbolic differentiation, numerical differentiation, they all basically try to approximate that, but they all have downsides. And so automatic differentiation is also not without faults. That's I think is very uh, honestly very clear about that. But in theory, automatic differentiation gives you that gradient without the approximation error that you would usually still have some like fine differences. And well, please, so that's basically why automatic differentiation sort of, and especially the modern automated way came to be very much so used in machine learning, um, especially after I think Tiana was like one of the first ones, and then after that we applied more and more into the training framework. And for example, in Bayesian inference, what we often do there is we basically want to be able to use gradient based inference methods. So, like the normal M Markov schema of the Carlo will take tons of iterations for you to actually get a very articulate posterior, which actually gives you a, a converged posterior. If you, have, if you have access to gradients, then all of a sudden you can switch to something like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And then all of a sudden you look at the realized 10x speed up, and then all of a sudden you can do much more interesting things. Still I, don't, best. Don't, 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 don't. I mean, I also want to call it has its intricacies. So I think you shouldn't just trust one method and say, okay, well, just because this works, it will, the answer must be correct. I think that's most of science is often wrong. The same is true for AD. It's like, I think with AD, once you have it work, like once you have it on your code, you should usually check that the result makes sense. And if you do it without checking that, then uh, it's basically quite flip. Um, like if, if you have a well-defined uh, domain specific language like PyTorch, then it will probably be correct because it has like this very defined semantics. And in these very defined semantics, you don't have to worry too much. But as soon as you go outside of that, it's like a more general AD tool, you don't have those guarantees. 
that's, I think, is something to be really aware of. And like also, there exist some things where, let's say, if you have a discontinuity inside of your domain, then, for example, the interface of the discontinuity, uh, grave is not really defined. AD will just gloss over it because it's used as a program, but it will give you a completely wrong answer. So that's something also to be aware of if you have discontinuities inside of your domain. It's quite common for us, for example, in computational fluid dynamics, if you set the shock for the domain, then you have like this traveling shock wave, and you have this like walking discontinuity. And there exist multiple ways. You can either um, blur out the interface, um, or you use some other trick. So, so there exist two main ones. So where we originally came from is reversal differentiation. And the reason that originally start out with reverse differentiation is essentially because reversal differentiation performs the evaluation um, against the computational flow and the way it naturally flows inside of your program, essentially you have to cache intermediate results. And for that, you usually need quite an elaborate caching infrastructure and you want to do a lot of optimizations because those caches also take up memory inside of your computer and then they can really destroy your performance. And basically, us being able to um, do that on a compiler level, we have some optimizations and access to a lot of information. But I will go more into depth later. That, that way, so a clear win for us was reverse differentiation initially. And reverse differentiation is co commonly used in machine learning, for example, because machine learning people they have a large input vector and a very small output, usually sometimes just one scalar or maybe two or three outputs they look at. And so basically, if, you, if your input is much larger than your output, then reversal differentiation is very, very efficient. But if you, for example, have a very small vector as an input and then a large vector as an output, like you, for example, have often see in sensitivity analysis, then fault mode differentiation is a lot more efficient. So is there an efficient uh, approach for the case when you have the same number of inputs and this, as the outputs? This is a segmentation case, pretty common. And so people would usually tend to form more differentiation because form more differentiation doesn't require caching. So that's that's usually like in terms of computational penalty. Uh, so reverse differentiation usually involves a penalty of just plus one. Like so usually, if we evaluate our derivatives and the performance that you have, the optimal will be two x. Like but you still have to do it in. And times, right? Uh, yeah, for, we, have to, we have to we have to do it twice because we have to walk it the. the do the entire forward evaluation and then evaluate in reverse again. Well, for reverse, but you say you, you, we can use forward to evaluate in inputs yeah, like, and outputs. So but this you can you use it n times. So. Yeah, with forward mode, there's also this further efficiency gain that you can have if you use a vectorized version. And then it essentially boils down to how, how wide of the vector you're able to push through your computation engine. Like on a CPU, you have vector instructions, if, for example, push through like 64 or 128 sometimes. And then forward mode is just way more efficient on these. If we all have. use GPU for that stuff, right? So yeah, but GPU for back then mode is also high. Okay, thank you. Any other questions so far? And basically, so uh, yeah, forward mode, you don't have to do this elaborate caching. So usually you get much lower grain overhead there. But if you, so it exist ways you can use forward mode for reverse mode, where you basically construct an unbiased estimator. But uh, they're quite nascent and they are not that well defined so far. So I would not really turn them so far yet. And so, what does AD actually do? So, in AD, uh, especially in the way that we use it these days, let's say you, you write your program in your normal, uh, normal forward mode or like your normal uh, function. And with AD, we essentially synthesize the gradient. In this case, reverse with grain. So we have one branch here, which is zero, so it will stay zero. And then here, um, this is x cubed um, when it's bigger zero, so it's not three times x squared. Have you already switched to what you're actually doing or you're explaining? Because I wonder how you do it. Like, are you doing syntactic rewriting or like how do you do it? We do that internally, but like the way we do it is like we get the compiler representation and then we do the compiler. Right. So you work on a uh, syntactic tree or what is it? Uh, no tree, just like the raw LDM. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into it later how that works. Yeah, no, no, sorry, that's interesting. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, this would be numerical differentiation, but numerical differentiation, as I said, has this approximation error. So, if you want to avoid that, then yeah, AD is your only real choice. So, the way existing frameworks and also, um, then, like, also into one PyTorch and text to 
But the way typical frameworks do it is they do AD on the source languages. So it's called source level AD, where you say you are in raw C++ code, you build your gradient from C++ code. And only then you would compile it and do the rest of the stuff. And so the sort of the way why you would want to do a lower level is if you look at this code, then this code is not really that efficient. So what you really want to do is you want to sort of like hoist this out of your inner loop to not have to evaluate it n times. And so basically, as we jump to slide back, this will have a computational complexity of n squared. But now all of a sudden, by being able to do these optimizations, which can quite natural to, to compiler, we go down from order n squared to order of n. And if that is accumulated throughout your program, you have see a lot of speed up essentially. Can you switch back and forth again? <laughs> yeah. So in here, you have the magnitude evaluation in here. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And you don't have to do that, right? Because it's not dependent on the loop counter. And if you switch, you just take it out. And oh, that, those are like normal optimizations, right? They, they, yes, those that... are normal optimizations that a compiler automatically does. Like a compiler always sees that, okay, well, this is, I can just do loop hoisting or loop invariant cache motion and can just move all this stuff out. And, uh, but if you do it on a source level AD tool, then you would not have access to that because that will happen after you perform the automatic differentiation. So your code will all of a sudden look very different. So, as I said before, so basically, this is essentially if you first optimize, then you go on to order then, and then if you then perform AD on that, then you preserve this fall of N characteristic. But if we do it on a source level, then you still have order of n squared, and then your AD cannot do much anymore, right? Like it's order of n squared, the optimization, because everything is sort of mangled up at this point here. The typical compiler optimization cannot hit anymore, and you will stay at order of n squared. But I kind of like the eager mode. Like I like to be in control even when I'm wrong, right? <laughs> Can I put a flag? No, do what I say. Don't try to optimize my code. <laughs> You can sort of say like minus O one, like a little compiler or O zero, and just say don't apply any optimizations, and then you will still see the same kind of performance. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Why would a compiler not be able to optimize source level AD? Shouldn't it? So if you give it the, the source level, uh, you know, derivative function, shouldn't it still optimize that? Or at this point here, it cannot hoist this out of the loop anymore because but, it takes a grade at its level then, and now it's fixed in there. So now it cannot do the loop hoisting anymore. But that's that particular optimization, but is it, is it that like that with all compiler level optimization or? Some are still able to hit, but all of them basically are based on heuristics. Right. And this, if, if that heuristic kind of gets smeared away by AD being applied. Got it. Then you basically are locked in place, and that optimization pass all of a sudden cannot work anymore because it looks over your code. And the heuristic doesn't hit, so it doesn't apply optimization. Okay. So during that point, it comes a low level uh, virtual machine. Um, like, if so, Enzyme works here at the low level virtual machine at that yeah. point. Um, so this is usually like for two compilers, like it applies the first optimization passes, and then. Um, yeah. So in, in essence, this would be like in this example, this is the compiler here, yeah. where the compiler begins to hit. Here, you first apply your AD tool, like for example, Tapena, Kodi, Pack, like this number of those. You apply it at the high level here, and only at that point, you enter into the compiler. Oh, okay. but I would still kind of go with Brad on that. Like, what has changed? Like, heuristics are not that precise, right? They're trying to uh, catch the pattern, and AD will repeat the erroneous pattern. Uh, so why don't do why wouldn't it catch that erroneous pattern, for example? So at this point, if you take the grain here, mm -hmm. it will also mark these variables as active, which means they're locked in place inside oh, of the device. Nice. Yeah. And so because they're sort of now locked so in, the heuristic has to go like two branches deeper or something to figure that out. And yes, it may not. Okay, that explains it. Yeah. Especially like when you have uh, even more difficult loops. Then taking the grade inside of it might mean, for example, that, for example, if you have a loop where you have two functions here which you want to take a grade of, uh, and let's say one is in theory invariant to loop motion. If you take the grade, it begins to be locked in place. So now it doesn't move it outside the loop, even though otherwise it would have before moved it out of the loop and performed the gradient once outside. 
So basically, um, the gist is basically if you differentiate after the optimizations, we get the simplicity faster, faster gradients, and faster gradients is uh, usually good for everyone. Um, and that's basically where um, LVM comes into play. And basically, we perform AD on a compile level. There are like, there are so, there are a set of intuitions here why that is a good idea. So basically, because we are working on a very low level, all these optimizations have already run. So we work on heavily optimized code, which already has all these loop invariant cache motions and loop hoisting performed upon. And so basically what we do is if you, uh, we don't really care about the front end language because we don't really see it that much. But um, no matter if you have a port run code or something, as long as there's an LVM compiler, it goes to the LVM IR. It's like this intermediate, this internal representation of the compiler. And then on that internal representation, we perform a differentiation, which at that point is heavily optimized. And then in the end, you generate the execute a lot of that. And so why would you want to use LVM? Um, in general, it's like it, it has a lot of front end, a lot of uh, code generation for as well for CPU, any type of architecture, but also for like, the GPU these days. NVIDIA, AMD, the info compiler is also based on LVM. We have a very well defined semantics of the representations so that we can perform, we can write our optimization or auto differentiation passes quite efficiently on there. There's a very good infrastructure to write those optimizations and transformations that you just need for automatic differentiation. And in essence, the nice thing there is essentially, because it's such a low level, it's also platform independent. So if you write one optimization pass or one transformation pass, you don't have to write one for, for the CPU and one for the GPU. Both are just one LVM transformation pass, and we're done. In reality, as a current disclaimer, the core of enzyme is still 50,000 lines of code. So, uh, yeah. so the, the, basically, the advantages here are we're able to access and modify the programs in turn point that we can also intercept inter -between, in between if that's useful. So, if I get a uh, runtime analysis, um, identify where problems come from, where things come from, and we are able to rewrite and modify library calls. So, even if you have uh, an MPI function in there. We will just be able to say, okay, there was an MPI sent, this becomes an MPI received in your reverse mode gradient, right? And we just do transformation uh, and we're done essentially. And for a lot of languages like Julia, Number as well, actually, and uh, we just run our own just in time compiler essentially. So you, you do run some optimization after differentiation. So are there some things that are better optimized post, uh, post AD or? Yeah, so basically we had this, uh, I'll go into it later, essentially we had this like zero computing paper um, where we basically showed for the first that you can do like general GPU AD and especially on the GPU, you, so usually, usually when you think about a GPU, you think like, oh, I have 90 or gigabytes of memory. We don't really care about your main VRAM because the VRAM is very slow for a compiler. You want to stay inside of the cache and the cache is very small. And so you want to heavily optimize to stay inside of the cache and actually still be fast. And then you need a ton of optimizations and also very specific optimizations to the devices. Okay. Um, but in, in order for you to optimize the whole code, you need to first run the uh, non-optimized code as well, or do you do it on the fly? Uh, we do it like, basically we do it on the fly. While, while for example, in the C++ code, your clang lowers the code, mm -hmm. we already begin to intercept and begin to work on that code. While like basically as soon as it gets on the first first time it hits the LVM IR, we begin to pick it up essentially. So usually what you would see is that your Clang compiler, for example, the normal setup runs two O2 optimization passes. You usually run between the first and the second O2 optimization pass. And did I get your question wrongly differently? So do you mean that the code has to actually execute in order to see how I was wondering because at which step do you know what you need to optimize? Like my, me, my understanding is nothing is run here. Like you don't know what no, your no, no, code we, is doing. We, yeah. we don't run like the code. Yeah. The actual yeah. code is only compiled at the end. So basically, you uh, when you compile your code, it gets lowered into the compiler representation. And then from that, a typical clang would then compile it, compile into assembly code, and then you're executable. And it's run on that L that internal compiler representation. 
so it uh, wouldn't be would, that's that calls for another question would, would would there be an advantage to actually like trace run the code look at what it's doing while in the runtime running and apply further optimizations so that's that's quite interesting because so um we also i can quickly jump i'll jump back in a second but like um so basically, this is fun enough looking at trace based AD versus non trace based AD, where number is non trace based compiler. And the performance of non trace based uh, just in time compiler is actually a lot better. We're able to perform much better there. So, so I, I get the point of because I get so the way JAX and PyTorch work, where they trace it, they can apply very aggressive optimizations, a lot of scheduling decisions on a very high level. That's why they perform so good quite often. Um, but especially if, as soon as you have language bridges which are not as amenable to tracing, like let's say you have branch in code, then often what you would usually have is let's say you have three branches of your code. Um, a trace based framework will just catch one of the branches usually. So now all of a sudden you're missing two branches. And if you have a non trace based E tool, you still have all three, three branches. And depending on the inputs, you will still be able to get a typical branching behavior that you have written as you wrote your code in the beginning. That's the major downside of uh, trace based tools. Oh, but like the other two branches may never execute, for example. Uh, they may, but like it's maybe sometimes you hit them and then you're like, yeah. Yeah, why don't you even write those cases that <laughs> they never get used? <laughs> in case, yeah. Oh, no, I'm telling that. <laughs> students, students do all sorts of. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it was a student writing some. Like, I don't know. Well, but that's the code that you want to optimize the most, right? Uh, yeah. Because, like, if some professional writes the code, they just do binary and. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have a professional writes the code. Why not just write assembly, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, it always depends on the abstraction that we work on. I think it's like um, a lot of AP and correctness of AP also boils down to that you have to understand. The abstraction level that you actually perform AD on, and that basically institutes a certain number of drawbacks and also some consideration that you have to make with respect to correctness. Um, so if you write on assembly level, and there exists one interesting example from the Cody Pack people recently where they take grades for certain set of wall grind, but that's a really uh it's really bad work, like it's really hard work. In fact, it's not, it's, not, it's an interesting case study, but you really have to like pain want to do that uh yeah as a hobby people enjoy stuff like that so. yeah the, the phd student looked quite sad i saw the talk really yeah quite <laughs> about it. i don't know if i'm well, like of course like... doing it that's a different story like like people do all sorts of stuff that is very tedious and doesn't lean anywhere it at least leads somewhere <laughs> Performance wise, they're like 90 times slower than we are. So that's like, mm. I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we just look at a typical radio free, that like a typical uh, uh, deep learning approach, for example, then A level essentially uh, automatically generates basically optimal gradient, and you really don't have to worry that much about it, also about branching behavior already. And on a high level, so it looks a bit different to what your package call look like, but essentially just uh, you say it's an alternative call and you give in your function and sort of the parent of respect to which you want to differentiate. That's all you need on the API level. And this is actually also like even if you handwrite it, like what the package used to do, uh, you can't do much better. But um, so where a lot of the um, interesting side on the academic side comes from an enzyme, it's like you are missing type information. On an LVM IR level, they throw away what kind of types we give them. And so basically we run, so if we think about, for example, about this, like a mem copy, it could in theory be a double, but it could also be a float. And you don't know that, but the behavior will look different. So you, if you perform reverse differentiation, if it's a double, then one of them is, is basically what we would call a constant. It's, it's not that more manageable, but like it doesn't really matter for AD. But then if it's a float, both are active, and your grades will look very different. So we are essentially running uh, on the inside, we're running something what we call type analysis, which is like a data flow analysis, which we basically regain type information. And with that, we are then able to basically uh, turn uh, and basically a non-tenancy problem at that level into where we know what the types are 
and we are basically that makes it that's what makes it possible. And basically, before we wrote that, uh, AD on the compiler was also thought to be impossible, so uh, that was sort of like the main analysis which made it possible actually. Uh, I need to. Can you like how do you infer the times? So it's basically we just step through the entire function and basically do like a sequential analysis here. After the, after also, the you, you go back to the source code. No, we do not. We do not go back to the source code. So you still work on the. Yeah, we basically step. Into, we basically step with the flow of computation through the entire computation and basically uh, demangle type information. So you do something like that. Like it's kind of. Yeah, they're, they're executing it, but well, it's not, like we don't get really executing it essentially at that level. But like we're basically we're we're creating a type tree, and we have to step through that tree sequentially to find the type of every single one. So you're like um, you know some like ML and um, I don't know what modern languages do type inference. Um, this kind of this you, is, you're using the idea is similar to those, right? Yes, but like this is type inference on, on the on the compiler level essentially. And basically, if you do it on a, like Jax or Python, should do it they're on a very high level, so they have all that information available, so they will never have to care about those kind of analysis. So, uh, just to convince you of what I'm telling is actually a uh, valid approach. Um, so, these are two of the main uh, source of transformation tools adapt uh, Microsoft and Pathenard out of uh, India and Argon. So um, there's this very famous benchmark called ADBench, which is one of the most common things to compare. So basically what ADBench does is has a, this, like an LCM cell, a bundle analysis, and a Gaussian mixture model. And then we drew in also an Euler solver, room filter four, and uh, Fourier transform, and some other transform as well. And our performance is by far the best. Uh, so, Charles, uh, speed up again. Yes. What is the ref? Oh. Are you? The, the reference is when you perform enzyme first and then compact, then form the transitions afterwards. So, the point is, is being to show that running a D after the optimization actually matters. Mm -hmm. So, you can also just tell the compiler, hey, don't do my uh, optimization beforehand. I do AD on the LVMIR level, and then I perform the compiler optimizations. And that's the reference. So running after the optimizations actually matters and gives you much better code. Are you measuring the compiling time or the performance time after you compile? This code? is the performance time. The performance of like the compiling with all these different compilers. Yes. So, so basically, for everything here, yeah, we usually run it on like some AWS instance. About 20 times for the first five times of weight at the average. For the Euler solver, is it just that the, the reference of Tapenad didn't complete? Or... So Tapenad ran out of memory. Ah, okay. So it's actually a, like an execution error, not, a, not even a yeah. slow time. Okay. I mean, running out of memory is a common issue for, for a lot of the more general AD tools, especially like on, on uh, GPUs, you can easily run out of memory. On a CPU, you can also quickly run out of memory. Yeah. Especially if you have a, have a machine with not a lot of RAM inside. You can You're storing it. intermediate results and things like that. Right? Yeah. Uh, you, you catch so adjoints, like to compute the adjoints. Yeah, like your intermediate adjoints and like the incremental adjoints will live inside of your uh, cache on the RAM. And if you have, let's say, it's just 16 gigabytes and you have a large program, that will very quickly run out of memory. There exist ways you can work around that. So I think if, uh, like in machine learning, a lot of the very large memory states they build on something called deep speed, which essentially uh, you type the entire storage hierarchy by uploading onto NVMe and your hard drives. But all of the more general AD tools don't make use of that so far. But that's of course what's called checkpointing. Um, yeah. I'll take a huge time hierarchy as well. Long time, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. When you're essentially all of these other tools, all of these other levels of your storage hierarchy have a much less efficient latency. So when you have a lot of access to it, um, it's the big barrack keeps pointing us three. Oh, is it? They yeah. keep pointing three. Yeah. Like, if, I mean, if you write in Julia, for example, we had a recent checkpointing paper where you essentially just write inside of your loop, like, hey, checkpoint here, and we're able to transform it and checkpoint there. 
But I think it's really a thing of like, if you have this like very long interest of solves. So then with PDE solving, we often run like 5,000, 10,000 iterations of the solver. You don't want to keep all of those in your cache. You just want to offload at some point. Okay. Oh, so your checkpointing is manual, but there is this paper for Lamuther and Siskin. I don't know the order. Uh, that yeah, they the, uh, revolve seven. They have this. I think uh, there's also a paper by Andrea Balta and uh, what is that name? It's like the inferring this checkpoint. Uh, yeah. Checkpoint. Yeah. But that's that only lives on the. Um, so it's an enzyme essentially we have some checkpointing, but it's mostly due to like intermediate operate operations we want to checkpoint there. But that's not if you have full function iterations like an iterative solver. So the, that checkpointing is done on a higher level instead of Julia. We'll probably port this back into the LM at some point, but right now. So uh, we are actually four times two four point two x faster um, than when you were performing your non-optimized code. So there are a number of extensions that we basically looked into. One of the main ones was uh, performing it on GPUs because that was sort of an unsolved problem at the time. Um, and basically, reversal AD on GPUs is quite finicky because uh, you have very, a lot of control flow, you have a lot of parallelism there, and also GPUs have very complex performance characteristics that you need to be really aware of when you do transformations on them. And also, uh, as I said before, like the, the number of caches that you have access to really gives you a lot, number of limitations that you don't have to work around. And so, out. If we look, for example, at one of these examples, is if you have, for example, like you would want to exploit a lot of the parallels or a GPU, you have like this parallel port. In the beginning, uh, during your normal forward pass, this is a retrace, like everything just writes into, into, your, into your array. But all of a sudden, it, in, on the reverse, it becomes a write race, and then it gets a lot harder to guarantee correctness. So you need specific analyses to guarantee that you have a correctness also in the, during the write race. And basically, it's just undefined behavior. And uh, as a, you basically want to define an undefined behavior in a way. That's sort of one of the main thing points here. And also, just to illustrate this sort of hash versus like. So this is like the global memory, that like VRAM that you would usually see when you buy a GPU. Like I have 48, 90, whatever, how many gigabytes of, of storage available to me. Where you really want to live as an AD tool is down here. Um, the registers, the, the very the L1, basically, um, cache. And then if you have to go up here, that's still OK, but you really don't want to flush into the main VRAM, because that's just very slow. So basically, we need to cache a lot of values in a very different way to run the CPU. But we still do all these analysis in terms of LVM. And all these optimizations reduce the overhead. And um, we had to basically write a ton of new optimizations to actually make this possible. And then the key point here is also, it's not only efficient now, but we can also guarantee that the code is correct. Especially in the gradients, that the gradients are correct. And we actually, like in the paper, we actually proved this theoretically. Um, so just to make sure that actually what we do makes sense. And performance was actually not that bad. So in the paper, we still have that in here, but that was essentially a bug uh, on the video on the video back end. Uh, that's like for those two are two year benchmarks. So there was some uh, allocator which, which misfired in here. But all the other ones, and especially if you have something like issues with dynamics, for example, uh, you're very close to the optimum. Like you cannot get closer to 2x, and it's was miles better than what other people were able to do before. So uh, those two are Monte Carlo transport benchmarks coming out of the one of the Oakridge libraries. And Power is this very large uh, reference library that you often use in the computing to prove that what you're actually doing is good and that's like you can sort of mobilize in that. Sorry, what is this plotting? Uh, it's, it's a, so this plot the overhead. So it's just plotting the overhead. Okay. So your typical computation will be one X, 
and it just matters how much more computation you need to perform the reverse mode gradient on that specific piece of code. Okay. And the D guarantee is it's a constant factor, but um, how large it doesn't guarantee. <laughs> So like the of that is essentially the, the time it takes to run your reverse differentiated code divided by the take, time it takes to run it just a forward pass. Mm -hmm. You run them separately and then you have to for most of uh, measurements essentially make sure that the correct the benchmarking is correct. Yeah, and if we just uh, so just to really show all of the analysis that we do actually makes sense. Um, this is basically just looking at, okay, well, this is where we started out with all of these individual solvers. So Lulesh was still able to run, but it was like 3,000 X slower, which is really like, you don't want to run that. Um, and then we begin to apply the first optimizations. And then you, you see here that even just, uh, for example, with Suniska Lurkin, you just unrolling it just takes a great to run. And here, this really just breaks down that you really need all these optimizations to actually get to the very good performances down here. But here, you really just like you need to perform all these optimizations. And without these optimization pathways, you would really not be able to run them at all. So now to sort of like almost close off. Um, so what we're currently working on is um, basically bring enzyme to number. So uh, instead of coin stack, you have your number JIT. Um, basically, JIT with no Python true is essentially the same as an NJIT um, for us. And so what is, why would you care about another JIT engine, especially um, in this context? So especially coming out of the differential rendering, differential simulations, we are now very quickly able to tell that your typical AD engine like Jacks and PyTorch can be very sub, uh, suboptimal if your code looks different. Let's say for, for them, this is also a trace based compiler, for example, but the, what they have is like in differential rendering, they have all these different rays. So they have thousands of very tiny kernels. And evaluation thousands of tiny kernels is often a very bad idea. So you want to fuse all of them together into one giant kernel and then push it through your GPU, for example, at capacity. And this is essentially what they do. And like they, they basically um, they went the extra mile and wrote their own uh, compiler and AD framework just for their problem, um, which is different from rendering here. And I think the interesting point here is um, we kind of see here is that, for example, if you look at JAX or, or PyTorch works the same way, if you have a loop inside of a machine learning framework, for example, and loops are very common for simulations and also other scientific code. What a machine learning framework does is okay, I have 10, 10 executions of the, of the loop. I just unroll the entire thing. So I basically I copy the code 10 times over. And the issue with a lot of that is that once you hit around 100,000 lines of compiler representation, even for a machine learning compiler, your compiler then begins to increase exponentially. And if you have a long loop inside of your code, you can very easily get up to those 100,000 lines of, of intuitive representation. But then your compile time just blows up and you really don't want to work with that anymore. That's why you basically want to have these more specialized behaviors, which are more uh, focused on scientific applications. So just a few uh, micro examples to basically show sort of, um, what's happening here. So this is just um, basically a loopy code. Um, we just essentially loop and then also um, just stencil uh, evaluations, which is quite common in PDE solving or different dynamics. And uh, performance uh, of actually using the number JIT engine is just a lot, lot better than uh, what a JAX or Hydrus is able to give. So, when you're saying number, it's not the vanilla number, it's your modifications to it, or now it's. And this is already with the modifications part. The modifications are now in the master branch. No, we don't. Uh, we can't upstream to the master branch. So you have okay. It's your branch yeah. of number. The issue is that like, we're, so we're working with some of the phone number people here, but it's like that the reason we can't go into the master branch is we have to change certain stuff in the backend of number because basically we have to introduce certain primitives 
and they don't want to have that on their master version because that would mean that it would have also have to be maintained long term. No. So what is your so is it like a research project then, or uh, like you are planning to fork number and do number E or something and uh, you know maintain it uh, separately? So specifications they look interesting, but can we use it? So just I don't want to confuse shit with browser. Just look here, like no, my question maybe is like so like all the code is public and we're basically part of the LVM organization. So it is usable. Everything is by usable, yes. And so for example, also uh, I mean. If you want help, we we'll usually meet on Tuesdays, but um, we also have documentation on the notes. So everything's public and you can always use it. Well, the, this C, C or whatever C code, but it will work in, uh, in your version of number. As yeah. well, right? it's just a... We also have, for example, uh, if you're more into the, into the machine learning world, we also have. Uh, there's a very well maintained Julia version. And then, for example, we also currently bring up a version in which you could basically have a foreign function that based to JAX, in which you can basically take your C kernel and give it to JAX. Um, and yeah, everything lives in there. Like everything is public, usable. Um, and eventually, Enzyme itself, so like the core of it, will be upstreamed into um, the actual LVM. And become part of the main repository, but right now there are still some fixes. And essentially, uh, for for you to be part of the main repository, you have to track the head of LVM development. And we often don't track the exact head because that would mean that every day you'd have to spend like two hours fixing bugs. Essentially, we just like every two weeks we go up to the head again. Yeah. There's certain constraints that force on development that right now we're not taking, but uh, eventually we'll be pushing up. Like basically LVM as a structure where you can be an incubator project. So I guess like if you're still working on a specific problem, and then but the ex clearly expressed goal is that at some point you will upstream into the mainline repository and then if it's not any compiler that you get off the LVM, like something. So inside of any um LVM based compiler that you pull, for example, also like the Intel compiler or something, and that will be in there. Uh, so, also just uh, some that is an example here. Basically, um, the core point here is that all these shit engines are kind of developed for different purposes. So, what you would want for if you want to realize your application is the JIT engine that kind of fits your purpose. Um, and essentially, if you look at number, for example, we're essentially 6x faster than Jax on these codes. This would look very different. It would have like CNN kernels or something. So that's also something to keep in mind. And around 9x faster than what uh, Python should O with its updated compilation diagram gives you. And essentially, what's happening here is um, number is. The only one essentially tra trace free compiler. Like in, mach in machine learning, also uh, first rendering, you really want a trace based compiler. And so, for example, JAX runs through the entire program with traces to essentially build up this trace IR. Uh, PyTorch does the same thing, uh, it has a uh, tracing front end, and Dr. Jit also does the same thing. And Numba doesn't need to do this. Numba essentially matches on the bytecode level with Python operations and it's non trace based. So we get a we get a trace free differential shift essentially here. So what happens actually? Uh, what how does a trace free JIT actually look like? So if we just just again go back to example where you essentially say okay we want a number JIT but without Python mode. Uh, then what actually happens here is that your code enters this like number pipeline and just basically looking at four of the main stages of that that actually of interest to us. So if we just distill those four stages, like you get your Python functions into the bytecode, you have your function argument separately, data number IR, 
So at first, you just match in the bytecode. That's basically how functions get mangled in. And then this goes into the first internal IR of number, which is called num by IR. It's an untyped IR, which means it doesn't have type, type information. Number runs its own type inference, which is actually quite efficient. So we actually, what we actually do is we take numbers type information and then replace with that enzyme type information because their type inference is more efficient than ours actually. And then this goes into the LVM IR that we actually work on and. So what does number enzyme actually look like? And um, if you just look at how it works uh, appropriately, uh, we basically are live inside of the LLVM bit and you mark on the high level, I want this grain to be differentiated. And then inside of the JIT, it actually simplifies your problem. And so basically, uh, just if you're also going through what the API to your user looks like, we want this to be essentially minimally intrusive. We don't want you to have to change your code. We, we are sort of working on finishing the full tracking of the entire numbers numpy support. So right now we're at like 90 odd percent and we'll probably get up to 100 pretty soon. And we're also trying to stay pretty close in terms of the front ends that we do with the design of the front end. So if you want reverse mode AD, for example, all you have to do is outside of the number enzyme, you have to import enzyme reverse and say, okay, I want this. Uh, if I have two arguments, this is the one I want to perform the grade from respect to, and this is the one I want to keep, to keep constant, for example. And then you're able to emit the value and the gradient. So for example, in Python and DAX, you usually emit the value and the gradient per default. We can also just say, okay, well, uh, the value, we don't, we don't actually care about it, so you can save yourself the computation in part, but you can also get both of them. It depends on what you want. And the same is true for forward mode, same API, essentially. You say, you give us the argument with respect to which you want it to be differentiated, and if you want the primal and the reverse. And maybe of interest to you if you also want to blend in more with existing work that you have or with machine frameworks, for example, you're also able to take in uh, custom gradients. So for example, if you have, if you, in your existing code, you wanted to have a gradient already, so you wrote it down by hand. We can also say, okay, well, you tell us, okay, well, this is my handwritten add joint. And you can say inside of the compiler, okay, for this operation, I already have my adjoint. Then Enzyme will know that for this function call, this is your adjoint, and it will just pass it around. And we don't uh, do this, we do this computation where you say, okay, I already have sort of optimal adjoint. And we can also, uh, if you want to sort of interface with machine learning frameworks, you can also do some interesting stuff here where we're essentially able to allow you to compile certain kernels just with Enzyme by Enzyme. And then type it into, into JAX and we'll just inline it essentially the kernel. We can do that for JAX as well as for PyTorch. So you're not bringing up deep learning at all. Uh, does it mean that uh, the specialized tools like PyTorch and the four are better uh, on this? No, we haven't written up the paper yet, is the answer. <laughs> so, like, we have a specific version of JAX with which we do uh, the AD with Enzyme. But we'll probably not have that out until the triple AI. Um, uh, but the, like the number wouldn't be the tool we use. Python wouldn't be uh, like. Uh, we, because we essentially we don't want to have to rewrite the library of uh, the convolution and all the attention matrices. And Can you do this for PyTorch, or you have to deal with Jax? That's better. Uh, we could do it for PyTorch, but uh, um, so for us. Uh, Jack is a bit easier. Huh? Erase that. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I can explain why, why it's when it's slightly different in spec class. Um, so essentially, there's a main design difference depending on the sort of the area they were designed. So if you think about PyTorch, for example, I mean, like um, also, okay. also roll it towards um, this. It shouldn't be I'll be able to see you already over there, or hmm? shouldn't be I'll Yeah, 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 but. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing what it shows. It's kind of tiny, uh, okay. and we have shared screen. Oh, right, so okay. uh, maybe can you stop sharing? Uh, yeah, of course. So you get the stage focus. So if you think about how PyTorch works, right? So PyTorch has as its main design principle where it was developed like Tiger mode. So basically, has what PyTorch has to do is they have that Python code. Oh. 
because it's remote. <laughs> no, I can't see that. <laughs> Okay, let's leave it here. Let's see. let's see. Can you can you like okay? Get it ready. Let's try, and I'll see it on the screen. <laughs> okay. So you you begin with your Python code in PyTorch, and PyTorch what PyTorch does it has something called called Torch Dynamo, which translates this into what's called FXIR, which is its internal representation. It goes into something called uh, Torch Inductor. Which then actually builds your device code. So if you have, and this is essentially where what we would call code gen actually happens. But none of that is essentially actually a common compiler infrastructure. They wrote it themselves because they had a lot of constraints coming out of there. So ones to support EA mode, but also sort of go to this compiled mode that Jax does. Because Jax, it's like before PyTorch 2.0, Jax's performance was just keeping increasing, and PyTorch was looking like, okay, our performance is not up to, up to on par anymore. So they had to essentially introduce this compiled mode to stay up to date with Jax and actually get the, in the performance rates. What Jax does is Jax has Python code, then goes into something called uh, Jax per, which is an internal representation. But then Jax directly goes into something called MLIR, which is this modern compiler IR, like multi level, and like a lot, there's a lot of nicety in there. And that is actually part of the LVM compiler toolchain. So we have a very clear path of actually just grabbing this code and then I see attaching ourselves to it. Whereas we don't have that clear point of attachment in PyTorch. Well, I'm curious on the cross uh, cross platform thing. So when you say you can combine the number as well as Jax, yeah. so in that case, if you have so you have one part which is not traceable, like which is not you don't have to trace it. Like when you, when you get into the Jax part, you won't it automatically go in, inside the traceable part? No, it's just uh, Jax is either one big kernel. Oh, so we essentially put log out one big kernel. And tell okay, well, this is a big kernel that you have with these characteristics, but you don't have the actual code yet. And then that that at the IR level it basically inlines the IR in there. And then all of a sudden, when, when Jack actually builds the executable, all of a sudden your IR is also there and this is actually also triggered with it in the executable generation. Okay. Yeah. Any so you mentioned some of the uh, distributed backends like MPI. Have you worked with any of the Actually, like NCCL and those other backends, which are supposedly more GPU interfacing and stuff like that? It's going to be opening up another can of worms, I imagine. But so we have support. Uh, so we've added support recently for CUDA streams, and as we added support for Blast and Lapa. So we don't have support so for two class, but it's mostly a matter of basically linking up the API calls. The same is true for something like Kudin and N. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at Kudin, for example, it implements the forward and the reverse inside of the library optimally. So you essentially, in, during AD, you just have to tell, okay, well, you have this forward, turn it into this reverse operation. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially just us, us wiring stuff up. Mm -hmm. And um, nickel might be the same, but I've never actually looked at nickel in depth in terms of API calls. Yeah, I was just wondering if you would see bandwidth benefits as well with compiler uh, level AD uh, versus uh, you know, just a speed up. I think it depends. Like, there also exists the easier option for you if you just want to circumvent that, where you just say, okay, well, on a single node, take, for example, enzyme and then use MPI and nickel to fuse it together, and you don't, then you have communication there, which is essentially unaffected. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to work around it. Interesting. Yeah, we will have to stop around here because there is another uh, talk happening next door uh, at one uh, that you all may be interested in. It's improving your science communication. Uh, this was a nice talk. You may, yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you so much. But uh, you're uh, also welcome to join that talk. There will be some light refreshments, et cetera. Uh, do you have like some parting words? Uh, yeah, <laughs> please, we are pretty close. I only have one uh, finished slide, actually. Okay. Yeah, why don't you share it? Slide number 80. <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, one that's shared. 
Yeah, I think so. No. Uh, it, I already see the my Zoom. It's the interconnection through the Zoom server. Uh, Speaking of slow bandwidth. <laughs> Maybe compiler would help. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you will have to recompile everything. And the whole civilization. Okay, <laughs> Okay, so just to summarize, so as a, we essentially what we are, we are a compiler plugin. So whenever you have the access to an LDM compiler, you can essentially just call as a pass and apply it to any language which compiles to LDM. Uh, C, C, Fortran are typical examples, modern examples like Rust, Swift, Python for number. Um, typically, we'll see at least a minimum 4.2x 4 4 speedup. We have state of the art performance across basically all general AD tools. And we are able to also do reverse mode AD on GPUs. Uh, we have a lot of optimizations internally that will give you much more efficient executable code. And we also have full support for CPU parallelism on the OpenMP, MPI, hybrid parallelism, you name it. You don't even need to write anything down for it. We just see the API calls and we do it internally. You don't have to do any annotation bit. Um, number enzyme is essentially we provide for reverse mode. Custom grade interface, also synth integration with Jackson PyTorch if you want to mix kernels uh, to better match performance characteristic, performance is highly competitive. Um, also, minimally intrusive to existing code. Um, and we essentially tie at dynamism branches loops. Um, everything is fully open source. So please feel free to have a look. And if you have any issues, always feel free to open a GitHub issue or just message us. For example, we have a you're in the official LDM Discord. The LDM Discord is also a category uh, 1 to PM on Tuesdays. So if you have, a have any actual question or an active question you want to have quickly answered, feel free to join. We're also mailing this, which you're always also open to ask questions on. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, very nice. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs>